they realize that the message of Jesus and the message of these street preachers do not line up. The students told him, he's only out here to make people mad. He's out here to provoke people. He's working his own agenda. He doesn't represent the church. He doesn't represent Jesus. They realize what a fake he is. And yet this man will go home and pat himself on the back and say, I planted seeds. I told the truth. And the proof is that I was persecuted for it. He planted no seeds that day. He merely drove people away. He merely made people angry. What was the fruit of all of this? Nothing. I think that these street preachers do more damage to our witness as Christians than good. As we gather this morning, may we learn to be a light to the world. As we lift you up, may you fulfill your promise to draw everyone unto you. Amen. Good morning, Open Door Ministries, and to all our friends and family on Facebook and YouTube. Great to be back sharing the Word of God with you again today. This week, I'm talking about kooky Christians. These are sort of some church issues coming up. Uh, really, if I were to retitle this, I'd probably talk more about our witness. Are we presenting the best witness possible to the world? What is our witness out there to the world, how are we presenting ourselves? How does it impact the way they understand Christianity? How do they understand Christians or Jesus or God based upon what it is we're doing out there in the world? And let's admit it, there are some very kooky Christians out there. I'm gonna talk about a couple of different ones. So um, I have a little quote here for you. Be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some person ever reads. That's attributed to William J. Toms. I haven't been able to verify that, but that's who supposedly said it. Be careful how you live. You may be the only Bible some person ever reads. And then there's another quote. It's usually attributed to St. Francis, but we don't know that he actually said it. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. And what these two particular quotes remind us is that people do watch us. If you wear the label Christian, and if you are out there really wearing that label on your t-shirts, on your car, on your hats, on the books that you carry, on your bookmarks, on everything that you do, if you've slapped little fish on, crosses everywhere, slogans and whatnot, people are watching you and people are going to decide what they think about the church, Christians, Jesus, and God based upon your behavior. That's why I don't have a fish on my car, because of the way that I drive. I drive like a little old lady, and I, I give out blessings to the people around me as I'm driving along. So I don't put any Christian bumper stickers or fish on my car because I would hate to be a bad witness while I'm out there on the freeway. Luckily, I don't have to drive the freeway very often. But our words and actions tell other people about Christians, Jesus, and God. And so we need to keep reminding ourselves of that. What are we presenting out there? Because on the one hand, we need to be authentic because the world can smell hypocrisy. We need to be authentic, and at the other hand, we need to be aware of the image that we are presenting. Paul, in the book Ephesians, in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter four, verse one says this, as a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We have been called as ambassadors of Christ. We have been called to be the light of the world. We have been called to be the salt of the world. We have a calling placed upon us that in this world today, the church, the people, the people who follow Christ 
are the living incarnational presence of Christ in the world today. We are his hands, we are his voice. People look at us and they assume that must be what Jesus is like. Are we presenting that? Are we worthy of that calling that is placed upon us? Now, let me talk about a group of some of my favorite people, street preachers. I just happened to do a screen grab. This is off of YouTube. People are always taking videos of street preachers and putting them up on YouTube so you can watch and kind of see what they're doing. This one is, uh, looks like it's, uh, it's definitely on Las Vegas Boulevard. I think it's outside Planet Hollywood. I can't quite tell. So, but uh, now most people probably would have no problem with somebody standing on a street corner sharing their faith if these folks weren't so obnoxious. Why are they all over YouTube? Because they are obnoxious. Why are these people choosing Las Vegas Boulevard to be the place to go and share their faith? Because they automatically assume that anybody who's in Las Vegas must be an evil sinner. And that this is the place where they need to be so they can find evil sinners and save them. But I'm guaranteeing you, it doesn't matter where you go, you can go to Dog Barf, Iowa, be on Main Street, one of the most sedate places in the world, and you'll find sinners there as well. But there's already an assumption in place here. But you can see, they've kind of, you know. Now, on this particular video, not much is happening. You just have Mr. Bullhorn guy. He's walking up and down the street there. And with his little bullhorn, he's telling them they're all sinners, and they're all going to hell. How many conversions do you think they get in a day? How many people do you think actually come up to them and go, you know, your words have touched me. I've considered what you've screamed at me, and I would like now to make a commitment to Christ. How many? I was reading a blog post by somebody who is a street evangelist, and somebody asked him that question. He's been out there for years doing this, and he says, well, I only know of of a handful of people who've accepted Christ. After years of doing this, a handful of people. And the follow-up question was, well, what happened to them afterwards? And he has no idea. They said a prayer and that was it. They weren't connected to a church in any way. There was no follow-up. It was just, okay, well, we've said the prayer, off you go. Did they really make a commitment to Christ? We'll never know. We don't know what the fruit of this is. Street preacher has a history of disturbances. This particular street preacher, this was in Canada. He was arrested for disturbing the peace because he got a little too obnoxious. He's yelling at people as they go by, calling them names, insulting them. And his justification is, well, the gospel is offensive. It offends people. The gospel is offensive. And I'm just telling them the truth in love. But if you're out there riling up a crowd, getting them angry enough that you are technically causing a riot and the police have to come by and arrest you, you're not doing God's work. You're doing your own work. See, because when I see something like this, somebody who is out there purposely being offensive, they're acting out their own sickness. They're acting out their own fleshly nature. They're acting out their own psychological problems. They want to be offensive, and so they use street preaching as a cover to do it. And unfortunately... When these people look at them and they hear this and it provokes anger, that's not what we're looking for. That if they were actually speaking as the Holy Spirit led them and guided them, it would bring them to repentance, not to anger. See, you, they oftentimes take that one verse out of context, that the gospel is offensive. But when you read what Paul actually says about the gospel being offensive, the reason that it is offensive is because Paul preaches Christ crucified. And to the Jew, that is an offense. 
Because if Jesus were truly the Messiah, he would be a king who conquered, not a servant who died. And so to them, it's offensive. To the Greeks, he says, not only is it a stumbling block for the Jews, but also to the Greeks. Because for the Greeks, the crucifixion is a shameful death for criminals. And how could you ever worship a criminal? That's why the gospel is offensive. Because Christ is a suffering servant who suffered the ultimate humility on our part. It's not offensive merely to be offensive, but it offended the sensibilities of honor and shame of the people who heard it. One of these anti-LGBT preachers was just arrested after elbowing a University of Georgia student. This guy's a frequent visitor to Georgia colleges and universities. And he stands out there and he riles up the crowd and he shouts insults. And when asked about it, why do you act in this way? You know, well, he says, you know that when, when, when you're doing God's work, they're going to hate you. That's what Jesus taught. They hated me, so they're going to hate you. So I obviously must be doing God's work because they hate me. He doesn't understand that they dislike him because he's an obnoxious jerk. And people oftentimes protest the way that he attacks people. He doesn't preach to them. He attacks them verbally. And so they gather in protest. And one of these protests got out of hand, and he ended up elbowing one of the students and found himself arrested. This is not like Paul, who is arrested unfairly. This is, I caused a major disturbance. I, I was disrupting the peace. I yelled fire in a theater. I went out with the purpose of agitating, and I did it. And so I have a real problem with these folks. These kooky Christians, these obnoxious Christians. Because it affects our witness. What are they really communicating? What are they really communicating when they're out there? If you have some guy standing on a street corner with a sign and a bullhorn, and he starts shouting at you that God hates you, what is he communicating? Is that a God you wish to follow? Is that a God that shows love and compassion? Are they doing God's work communicating the truth? Because what is the truth? What is the gospel truth that is out there? The gospel truth is simple. That God humbled himself out of love. That God humiliated himself out of love for his creation. That's the gospel truth. Instead, they preach, and they preach a God who hates, a, pre, a God who wishes to destroy. Are they communicating the truth? And the answer is no. The students, when they ask the students, you can go on YouTube, you can look at this, they ask the students, what do you think about this guy? And these students are not Christians, but this was their answer. He doesn't represent the Jesus they preach. They realize that the message of Jesus and the message of these street preachers do not line up. The students told him, he's only out here to make people mad. He's out here to provoke people. He's working his own agenda. He doesn't represent the church. He doesn't represent Jesus. They realize what a fake he is. And yet this man will go home and pat himself on the back and say, I planted seeds. I told the truth. And the proof is that I was persecuted for it. He planted no seeds that day. He merely drove people away. He merely made people angry. What was the fruit of all of this? Nothing. I think that these street preachers do more damage to our witness as Christians than good. Ah, yes, I call this one Saved by the Bell. That's my pun for the day. This particular individual, his name is Jonathan Bell. 
And in the 90s, about mid-90s or so, he came to Dallas and he did two shows, two shows on the Dallas Public Access Network. One was known as the formal show because he wore a tuxedo that day. And this one, where I took the picture from off of YouTube, is known as the casual show. Each one is an hour-long rant. He tells a story that he came from Canada, came to Ontario because he had got a call to be an evangelist, and he did these two public access shows. And for that entire hour, he screams. In fact, if you were around in the 90s, late 90s, you probably would have seen him. His video was passed around. And he was known as Screaming Boy because he screams at the camera for an hour, just ranting and raving about how terrible everybody is, except for him, of course. He spends four or five hours a day studying the Bible. God speaks directly to him. And he's trying to save everyone. But if you do a little background check on him, if you kind of find out about him, he's got domestic abuse charges against him, abuse against an invalid charged against him. The last he was heard of, he had charges for molestation against him. This is an individual who picked up a style of preaching that allowed him to say ugly and offensive things under the cover of the name of God to act out his own sickness. He's this angry, warped, twisted individual who put on a mask, look, I'm a Christian evangelist, and acted out his sickness. What kind of witness is this? What kind of witness is this? Luckily for us, most people, when they watch this, and you can go on YouTube and you can watch them, you can watch both shows, the formal and casual show, they're there in all their glory. If you read the comments, they're like, this guy is psychotic. And they recognize this is not what Jesus is. Our witness, are these people living a life worthy of their calling? Are they living in such a way that they communicate Christ crucified? Ah, yes. Now let's move on to my second group of people, super Christians, Jesus freaks. You know them. You've seen them. You've encountered them. You might even have been one at one time. This particular little, this little particular, uh, poster, this is from uh, an old movie called Super Christian. It was a 1980s film. It was made in 1980. That's, uh, I don't know if you ever had the pleasure of, anybody ever watched this? I watched it, right? The lesson really is about piety for show, this particular individual in the film, he uh, goes to church on Sunday and he puts on a super Christian outfit and he acts like a super Christian, says all the right words, bless you, bless you, right? Carries the right Bible, big old Bible. It's got tabs and it's been underlined and all that kind of great stuff. Does big long prayers like he's supposed to. Does all these super Christian things. Very pious on Sunday. The rest of the week though, he doesn't do any of that stuff. He's just your normal, everyday guy. But he puts on a big show every Sunday. And the lesson of it is, you know, you should most be living out your Christianity in your daily life, not just putting on a show for Sunday. That's the lesson of the movie. But we've seen these people, these super Christians, right? On, uh, I believe this was uh, Quora, one of the questions that was asked, is it rude to pray before a meal in a restaurant? Is it rude to pray before a meal in the restaurant? Now, I know some of us, we pray before our meals in a restaurant. Now, the way that I was trained up in ministry, and we're talking millions of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, the way that I was trained up in ministry is that when it comes time to pray over your meal in a restaurant, you're saying a simple blessing, you're giving thanks. That prayer is fixed to a purpose, to give thanks to God because all good things come from God. And we are merely acknowledging that even the food on our table comes from God. And that's what we're supposed to. So that's why we say this prayer. 
the minister that originally trained me, the first time we went out, and he was going to say a prayer, and it was, you know, okay, you say a prayer. He stopped me before I, I, I started praying, and he said, I want to remind you of something. This is just a prayer to bless the food and say thank you to God for it. This is not the time to pray for Auntie Griselda's sick cat. This is not the time to pray for all the missionaries in China, each one by name. This is not the time to pray for you know, the entire church in our country, in our state, in our city, and all our officials. This is not time for that. Quick, simple prayer. We acknowledge that God has given us all good things. And so whenever I do a prayer over a meal, that's what it is. Very quick. Just, I'm just stopping to acknowledge that God has given good things. We've been in restaurants, and I know some of you have been in restaurants, where doing prayer becomes a huge show as they pray very loudly and get everybody's attention. I've talked to some servers. They're like, oh, you know what I really hate? I get the food there, and that's when they stop me. And they're like, we need to pray first. Would you like to join us? <laughs> she told me, no, I just want to put the plates down. I got more plates and more tables. See, the question is, is it rude to pray before a meal in a restaurant? Is it a show? Many of the answers were the same. Absolutely not. It's not rude to pray before your meal. Christians and non-Christians agreed on this. As you read through all the comments, the Christians and the non-Christians agreed on this. Absolutely not. It's not rude to pray for a meal. If you want to say grace and thanks to God before your meal, you have every right. It's not rude at all. Now, there's no need to make a spectacle about it and draw attention to yourself, but it's totally fine to say grace if you want to. As long as you're not making a spectacle, as long as you're not making a scene, as long as you're not causing some kind of commotion, then everybody's cool with it, Christian and non-Christian alike. Alan Noble from the Gospel Coalition says this, we certainly shouldn't say grace in order to be seen saying grace. And yet, we've run into people who do that. It's a show of piety. Or to make people uncomfortable. We don't pray loudly so that others will be shocked and disturbed by our piety. It's my way of witnessing as I shout my lunch prayer. I'm casting my bread upon the water. All those heathens will now see what a real Christian is like as I pray for 10 minutes loudly over my food. We don't pray loudly so others will be shocked and disturbed by our piety. Being a Jesus freak just to be a freak capitulates to the game of secularism and that it turns our faith into an advertisement, a signal to others. The practice of our faith turns out to be the advertising of our faith, which is the exact kind of hollowness at the core of so many contemporary beliefs we are seeking to avoid. Are we practicing our faith because of our real, genuine devotion to God? Or are we trying to advertise, I'm a Christian? If you have to advertise you're a Christian, and people can't tell without the advertisement, maybe there's a problem. And whenever you pray, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, and whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. Jesus would go on and say, hey, when you, when you pray, go home and into your closet and be by yourself. Don't do this for show. Our devotion to Christ should never be a show advertising to other people. Do you know why? Because they recognize it for what it is. They recognize it. When I talked about evangelicals, I think it was last week I talked about them, I talked about two books, and both books mentioned the hypocrisy of Christianity. The phony show that we put on, trying to convince everybody, look, I wear the right shirts, I have a big old cross around my neck, I carry a big Bible, I have a bumper sticker on my car, and a fish. I'm a Christian. And it's all for show, and they recognize it. See, because they see you 
not just on Sunday. They see you not just when you're wearing your shirt. They see you not just when you're carrying your Bible. They see you every day at work. They see you in line at Starbucks. They see you at the restaurant. You know, at that restaurant where you made that big showy prayer and then were abusive to the waiter? Abusive to the waitress? Where you refuse to tip because... I only give God 10%. Why would I give a, a server 18%? Where you got obnoxious in that restaurant and behaved poorly because you felt entitled? They've been watching you. They watch us. And the question always comes back to what is our witness? Do these outward shows of piety present a good witness? Or does it merely highlight our hypocrisy? Super Christians, you know the ones I'm talking about. I grew up with a whole bunch of them. I grew up with all kinds of these folks. And it's no to everything. Acts of pie, right? I let no unclean thing come before my eyes. And they have a whole list of things that are unclean. We had a multiple page list of things we weren't allowed to do at my private Christian schools with Bible verses to back them, like chewing gum. Chewing gum is evil. I don't know what the Bible verse was. I would give anything to get a hold of that list again so I could look up and find out what that Bible verse was. I've looked up in the Bible chewing gum and I haven't been able to find it. Anyway, no secular music. No secular music. I will only listen to Christian music music why why no secular music well you're supporting the evil lifestyles of the performers have you seen some of the lifestyles of the christian singers as they're going through their second or third marriage as they're struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction no harry potter movies Promotes Satanism and witchcraft. No R-rated movies. They use bad words. No video games. All the violence in video games. It's turning us violent. No alcohol. No alcohol. Alcohol is evil. Causes all these societal ills. Now, I personally don't drink. I don't. There's a reason for it. it. has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with my religious convictions. I don't drink because I come from a long line all throughout both sides of my family of alcoholics and addicts. And knowing that, knowing that a lot of my family were alcoholics and addicts, my older brother, my cousins, grandparents, knowing that they were alcoholic and addicts, it means that I have a higher percentage chance of becoming one myself that if i were to start drinking i may not be able to stop and so i made a choice does that make me better than you does that make me a better christian not in the least i could be all pious about it but there's no reason to be because it has nothing to do with my religion no i love lucy i actually knew a person whose father forbid them, this was in high school, her father forbid them from watching I Love Lucy. And, and I'm like, why? What, why, why? Why can't you watch I Love Lucy? And the answer was because Lucy is constantly scheming against Ricky, which shows disrespect to the father who should be the head of the house. She is not a submissive wife. She's a bad example for Christian women. No, the Babysitter's Club. Okay, anybody in here read the Babysitter's Club? Uh -oh, we get, okay, we got, we got Teresa. She's like, yes, I read it. Do you know they have single moms in there? Oh my goodness, evil. That woman needs to get married. Bring herself under the submission and authority of a man. And the question is, when these people start spouting this, what kind of witness are they putting out there? Are they living up worthy to their calling? 
Are they living up worthy to a calling who says, you know, it's not about taste not, touch not. It's not about all these rules and regulations like you had. It's about how you treat your fellow man. See, whether or not I watch a Harry Potter movie has nothing to do whether or not I love my neighbor. It has nothing about how I treat other people. And so when I hear this stuff, I'm just like, what kind of crazy, kooky Christian are you? That's, that's really cool. Brownie points for you. You're all virtuous. I just don't want to hang out with you because you're definitely not much fun. Of course, there are Christians who go the other way around. Oh, yeah, oftentimes when we talk about super Christians, I like to give them this little first place award. The message they oftentimes send is, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than you because I don't do all these things. I don't do all these things. See how much better I am than you? I'm much further along in my Christian walk. I'm more spiritual than you are. I can't believe how worldly you are. We had uh, one person in our college group, you know, all the folks I hung, I hung out with at college. We had this one person in our college group, absolutely no R-rated movies. Mm -mm. It's not G-rated, we're not seeing it. So the rest of us are like, I don't see really kind of a big problem about this. So we would all decide to go to the movies and this person would come along. Where are you guys going? Oh dear, here we go again. All right, we're going to the movies. What are you going to see? We tell them the name of the, that's an R-rated movie. I can't go see that. And I had to bite my tongue every time to go, that's why you weren't invited. Notice your phone didn't ring. Notice nobody let you know we were going. You had to hunt us down and find out where we were all going. We know, we get it. You're not going to R-rated movies. That's why we don't tell you about them. They also had a thing against us getting together and playing poker. Even though we were playing for no money, we weren't gambling, we were just getting together and having a good time and playing for poker, usually for M&Ms. But you know, how evil that was. They weren't perfect, they were just better than us. We were kind of worldly Christians. A lot of my friends went to Biola they couldn't believe that all these Biolans would get involved in all of this. I can't believe you're doing this. I didn't go to Biola, by the way. How your piety expre is expressed communicates your motive. What is your motive in doing all of this? Is it simply to say that you're better? Are you trying to convince us that you're more spiritual than the rest of us? Because it doesn't sound that way. It's not how people hear it. All right, so let me go about the ones that go the opposite direction. I've been in a group of guys, right? You hang around church for long enough, you might end up in a men's ministry somewhere. And some of the guys, you know, they're like, first time I joined them, they pulled me aside. They're like, we just want you to know that uh, we're not like those overly pious people. We actually get together every once in a while and smoke a cigar. <laughs> And there was a smugness about it. About we're better Christians because we don't follow these silly rules. We have liberty. See, it's all about your motivations and your attitudes about all this. Do you think you're a better Christian because you eat meat or don't eat meat? Paul dealt with that issue over and over again. Who's the better Christian? Well, we keep kosher, so we're better than you. Oh, you follow, we don't follow those silly rules. We have liberty in Christ. That makes us better than you. It's all about that motivation and how you communicate that to other people. Are you trying to communicate to them that you're better spiritually because of what you do? Are super Christians simply virtue signaling? Virtu virtue signaling is the act of speaking or behaving in a way that's meant to demonstrate one's good moral values. We see people do it all the time. The most famous example you can probably think of is the ice bucket challenge. You guys remember that? The ice bucket challenge was all the rage a couple years back. People participated in the ALS ice bucket challenge without making a donation, suggesting that they cared more about participating in the event and the attention associated with it, with it than they did about supporting the related cause. 
See, the whole point of the ice bucket challenge was you were supposed to make a donation. It's like, oh, well, if you don't make a donation, you dump a thing over your head. But there it was, all over social media, all the social media sites, people dumping buckets over their head. Look at me. Look at me. And none of them gave a donation. They didn't care about the cause. They cared about the attention. I will commend one particular star who actually did a video for the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Patrick Stewart, you may know him as Captain Picard from Star Trek The Next Generation. I thought he did a great job about it because he took the ice bucket out, took out two ice cubes, put it in a glass, poured himself a sh some scotch, and wrote a check to support. I'm like going, that's how you do it. Not look at me, but here's the money. I support you. Virtue signaling. Oh, like this one. This is one of my favorites. I saw this one beginning to appear on Facebook all over my feed. Let's start offending everyone by wishing them a Merry Christmas. I have a lot of issues with this one. First off, nobody's really offended by saying Merry. That is just a myth. That is something that was concocted. That's just a lie being sold. Nobody's offended by you saying Merry Christmas. Why do we say Happy Holidays? Because we are simply acknowledging that some people don't celebrate Christmas. They celebrate something else. If you wish me Merry Christmas, I'm not going to get offended. Great, thank you. But this is just virtue signaling. I'm part of this in-group. Mm -hmm. I belong to, this, to the correct group. We say Merry Christmas. I think the part about it is, let's go out and offend people. That's the goal. That's the purpose. Let's go out and offend people. I want to offend people. That's the motivation behind this. I want to offend people. And I have a problem with that. Virtue signaling. Here's my response to it. You have been awarded two virtue points. Good job. You said something virtuous on social media and solidified your membership in a particular political group. Good job. Is that all they're really doing? Oftentimes I'm presented with memes from people who are virtue signaling that they're Christians. If you're not afraid to post this, type amen. If you're not afraid to say that you follow Jesus, Repost this. It's just virtue signaling. It has no purpose whatsoever. It's even kind of obnoxious bullying at one point that if you don't post it, you know, you must be afraid or ashamed of Jesus. Super Christians. Again, Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Beware practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Beware of virtue signaling. Nobody cares if you pray before your meal. Do it. Don't be obnoxious about it. Nobody cares if you want to post your meme. If you want to say, hey, I think God is awesome, then post that meme. Awesome. Nobody's going to say anything about it. When you start virtue signaling, I bet you won't repost it because it uses the name of Jesus. Then you're being obnoxious. You're doing it in front of others just to be seen. What is your motive in that? What kind of witness does that put out? All right, the final group I'm going to talk about is Christless Christians. I've talked about street preachers, talked about the super Christians. Let me talk about Christless Christians for a second. Christless Christians. Those are Christians who define being a Christian by some other test than the one that Jesus gave us. Who do you say that I am? That's the only test of being a Christian. Who do you say I am? Nothing else is a test of Christianity. And yet, I've heard all kinds of things. I've, heard, I've had people 
And I've seen people post it, read their comments. If you vote on this proposition this way, this is the litmus test of Christianity right here. If you're voting this way, you're not a Christian. That's not true. That's not true. That has nothing to do with Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turns to him and says, you have answered correctly. I've now read several books and multiple articles and some scholarly articles on the phenomenon of evangelicals and QAnon. And over and over again, we are seeing that this whole QAnon belief system has overtaken the evangelical churches. But we weren't called to worship QAnon. We weren't called to preach QAnon. QAnon has nothing to do with Christ crucified. QAnon has nothing to do with who do you say I am. Most of the stuff that I've read indicate that all these evangelicals who follow along with this QAnon stuff, they're all at different levels. Some of them are just kind of on the surface. They see QAnon as opposition to child trafficking. Nobody's going to argue against that. The only problem with is the way they're going about trying to fight this problem of child trafficking makes it worse. It takes the focus off where it needs to be. It actually hinders the prevention of child trafficking. But as you get deeper and deeper into some of the conspiracies that go along with it, as it has become sort of this all-encompassing conspiracy, you get into white nationalism, you get into anti-Semitism. You get into the belief that lizard people rule the earth. Only the people at the deepest levels really begin to do this. And from what I've been able to decipher from all of this, is what probably started as a really bad prank on 4chan was picked up by somebody else for clickbait and popularity and snowballed and got out of control. We probably know who it is. We don't have, we can't just definitely say here's the exact evidence and proof so I won't give you the name of the person. But we pretty much sure we know who it was. And they move from 4chan to 8chan to 8kun. These more radical forums. But it's come into the evangelical church. And it's become the major topic of the church. When did we stop preaching Christ? When did we stop preaching Christ crucified? The God that steps down from heaven, that sets aside his glory, that suffers on our behalf. When did we stop preaching that and start preaching this in our churches? This has no place. This has made our churches a Christless Christianity, which is no Christianity at all. I put this picture up here. Most of you probably don't recognize them. Anybody recognize them? This is supposedly... I call him supposedly pastor, but he is a pastor. He pastors a church. His name is Pastor Mark Burns. And recently, he appeared at a rally at John Hagee's church where he led the crowd, a large crowd at a rally, into a chant of let's go Brandon. Let's go Brandon. And the crowd got into it. In this, ch this church crowd really got into it as they all started ch chanting, let's go Brandon. Now, if you don't know what that code phrase means or what it's for, anybody not know what that code phrase means or what it's for? It's a covert way of saying F you Biden. That's right, 
in a church. This is what they're all chanting. Oh, but they didn't actually say it. I got busted for that. I may not actually have said the word damn, but I said darn. And as was explained to me, that that's what was in your heart, and it's what's in your heart that matters. Whereas Proverbs says, out of the abundance of your heart is what comes out of your mouth. Everybody knew what they were saying, and it reveals what was in their heart, and it reveals something of a fleshly nature. That this man, supposedly a man of God, stood in front of a church and led an entire congregation to reveal their fleshly nature and was praised for it. And you tell me, you show me chapter and verse in the Bible where it says the political party you belong to is what defines you as a Christian, that that's the litmus test. Because I will contend with you that the only test for whether or not you are a Christian is who do you say I am? And it's the question that Jesus asked us. That was not the question that was asked by this person. A Christless Christianity. What kind of witness does that give to the world? That if you don't ascribe to a certain political philosophy, you can't join the church, you can't be saved? What kind of witness is that? Our witness is not our theology. Our witness is not our theology. See, when I put this all together, when I really think about this, when I say, how do I act this out in my life? How do I communicate a message? What do I think you need to hear? I want you to hear that our witness is not our theology. There are 42,000 denominations, and the church is famous for killing off heretics. Oh, we don't burn them off at the stake anymore. We used to. I'm sure there's a lot of churches that would like to go back to doing that. But we'll destroy their careers. Rob Bell, who was a rising evangelical, had his career destroyed for merely asking the question, do you think hell truly is forever? Or can it serve a redemptive purpose? He had his career destroyed because he didn't tow the party line. 42,000 denominations we have. Why are we not unified around Christ? I don't understand. Why do we destroy the career of anybody who doesn't tow a certain theological line? Non-believers, non-believers aren't drawn to Christ because of a church's theological viewpoint. There has never been a non-believer who looked at our bulletin or went to our website and pulled up our statement of faith and said, now, now I'm going to become a Christian and go to that church. Can we be honest? The statement of faith is merely for the rotation of the saints. Churches put out a statement of faith so that people who are already Christian can look at it and go, I agree with them, I'll go with them. Look at another one. I don't agree with what they teach. I'm out of here. It's for people who are already saved. Our theology is not our witness. That's not what draws people to Christ. Our witness isn't how many people we can make angry at us. Sorry, street preachers. Sorry, you ranting people on YouTube, Facebook, all the rest of it. Your ability... To get somebody mad doesn't mean you're preaching the truth. You aren't being persecuted. You're just being a jerk. Being obnoxious is not a Christian virtue. Why is the gospel offensive? Because it talks about a God who would shame himself on our behalf. It's not offensive because you're calling somebody nasty names. Rabid Christians spewing hate don't align with Jesus in the world's eyes. That's why those students, when they look at these people, go, they don't represent the organizations they claim to. They look nothing like Jesus that they're supposedly preaching. Our witness isn't what we're opposed to. 
And there's a long list of things you can be opposed to. You can be opposed to abortion. You can be opposed to homosexuality. You can be opposed to Harry Potter movies. You can be opposed to the babysitting club. You can be opposed to I Love Lucy. You can have a long list, opposed to alcohol. You can move, all, all those, I'm, maybe you're opposed to, you know, bread at communion instead of, you know, unleavened bread. Maybe you think you have to have real wine or grape juice at communion. It's not what you're opposed to. That's not our witness. Non-believers know piety when it's for show. They smell the hypocrisy over and over again. That's why they tell us, this is why I don't like the church. The hypocrisy in all of it. You can say you're pro-life. But if you leave a mother and her child hungry and starving, non-Christians are going to look at that and go, what's the point? You don't look very pro-life now if you let that child starve. I know I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I'll never forget walking down the street with a non-believing college student, friend of one of our college ministry kids, wanted to ask me some questions. We went down to Main Street on Huntington Beach, walked down to the pier. I'll never forget that experience. Because when he saw a group of Christians standing out there doing piety for show, playing their little guitar, singing their little worship songs, hands, oh, we're worshiping Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, da, 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 da. on and on they went. What's that all about, he wants to know. Oh, well, they're worshiping Jesus. You know, they're, they're singing praise songs. Oh, so they're all Christians, yeah. Well, then how come they don't do something about that? And he points a mere couple of feet away to a homeless lady shivering in the cold. Nobody offered her a blanket, sweater, meal, money. A few feet away. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And all that could go through my head at that moment was that whatever you do to the least of these you've done to me, they left Jesus sitting in the cold while singing his praises. We didn't get much further. We got down to the pier, just at the start of the pier. Guy standing there on a box, street preacher. As we approached, he looked at me, he turned to me first. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I do. Well, then move on. I don't need to talk to you. What was that all about? He figured I didn't need to be evangelized since I'm already saved. Oh, so he can't be nice to you? He can't be friends with you? He can't talk to you? The only reason he can talk to you is to save you? Isn't that kind of using you? Yeah. We can't actually have relationships with people and talk to them and be with them unless we can evangelize them. Is that the only thing we can do? Non-believers know piety for show. They see the hypocrisy. It destroys our witness. Our witness isn't our politics. American dirty politics, and it's dirty, folks. It's nasty. Has done nothing but create divides, even within the churches. Can you believe it? Even within the churches. The people who should be able to unify around Christ have had their churches divided over politics. It's dirty and it's nasty and it's worldly and it brings out the worst in us. Our witness is our love and our unity. The old spiritual song, we are one in the spirit. They will know we are Christians by our love. When people see us and they see love and they see unity, then they're going to know we're different. Then they're going to see something that they're going to see as attractive. They're going to go, you know, there's something different I need to find out about this. 
But until they see love and unity, forget it. And I know a whole lot of church members who are like, well, Christians aren't perfect. <laughs> We're just forgiven. We're not asking you to be perfect. We're asking you to be Christ-like. Are you going to stand up and go, we're not Christ-like. That's not what we do. But we're forgiven. (laughs) Until this world sees Christ-likeness in us, it destroys our witness. Until they see love and unity, it destroys our witness. Later, after I finish this series, at the beginning of the year, I'm going to start into the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans is about creating unity. That was the problem facing the Roman church, was unity and loving one another. And you'll see Paul, one of the greatest masters of rhetoric of all time, build a very careful case and argument for love and unity within the church. It's a message that we need to hear again. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. It's not going to be the t-shirt you wear. It's not going to be the fish sticker on your car. It's not going to be the Bible you carry. It's not going to be the political party you belong to. It's not going to be what you are opposed to. It's not going to be what you chant in church. It's going to be whether or not you love one another. That's going to mark you as a disciple of Christ. Nothing else. Who do you say I am? I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you're my Lord. I want to be your disciple. I want to imitate you and follow you. Well, then they will know you're my disciple when you love one another. That's the witness we need to carry. With all that in mind, let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, first we have to stop and we have to, we have to ask for forgiveness. It's so easy to take our eyes off of you. The old song tells us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And so often our eyes turn away from you. We get caught up in so many different things. And so church after church splits. We have lost our love for one another. We have lost our unity. We have destroyed our witness in this world today. We have traded being obnoxious We have traded being pious. We have created a Christless Christianity. Forgive us. Father, I just want to pray for those within this church. I know there are many people right now who are suffering. They've lost friends and they have lost family members at this time of year. Being being Christmas time this time of year is so difficult on them as they have to face a first Christmas without that friend or without that family member. Father, there are those who are struggling with health problems right now. We just ask that your Holy Spirit goes out, not only to touch their body, but to touch their minds and their hearts and their spirits to give them encouragement during this difficult time. Lord, help those who are going through depression right now, Lord. I hear from people all the time who are just, they're depressed. Yes, it's Christmas time, but they just can't get into that Christmas spirit. They just can't seem to lift themselves out of their anxiety and depression. We've been cooped up and locked up and, and the world has changed around us and we're, we're adjusting to that change and it just, it doesn't feel the same as it used to be. And that has upset so many people. Father, just uphold them, encourage them. Give them the strength and endurance they need to continue on. For those that that need help, let them seek out that help that they need. Don't let them suffer alone or in silence. Let them reach out. And then let us be willing to walk alongside of them and encourage them. We just pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, I hope you all come back next week for more church hot button issues or as I call it, stuff that just irritates me. Now we're gonna continue talking about church hot button issues and I'm looking forward to sharing some of that with you. But let me close with this and our benediction today.
Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Go in peace. God bless you all. You are dismissed.